Tēnā koutou katoa. Nei te mihi ki te mana whenua, ki te nai tohuriri, tēnā koutou. No ōtoutahi, me te matau a Maui o Kutipuna, no Chile, no Santiago Ahau. Ke ōtoutahi Ahau e ho e no hoana, he ahorangi, te kura, putaiao koiora. Ko Jimena Nelson, toko ingoa, no reira. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou katoa. Haere mai, and welcome to the University of Canterbury's Tauhere UC Connect lecture series. Uh, the lectures are free, and thank you for registering to attend. If you haven't already done so, you can sign up um, to be alerted to upcoming um, public lectures at UC um, just outside. And thank you very much for joining us. It's really nice to see so many faces. I hope that you enjoy this evening. Um, first of all, a little bit of housekeeping. I've got to read my notes for this. Um, please, if you have got your phones on, please turn them on to silent. Um, <laughs> I see a few of you do. Uh, I'll be talking for roughly about 45 minutes and we should have 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A afterwards. Um, in the event of an earthquake, stay still um, and just take shelter. If there is another form of emergency, um, please follow the friendly UC um, staff who are outside right now and they will lead uh, to our evacuation point which is just outside and turning to the left. If you do need the bathrooms, there are bathrooms on either side, just go behind us basically. So I think that's about it. Um, Today I'm going to be talking about um, some research that I've been doing on the topic of animal joy, but I haven't been able, I'm no expert in this field, so I'm going to be talking more generally about animal emotions and some of the implications that that might have. But beforehand, a little bit of an overview. I work in quite a broad um, array of fields. So um, as a quick overview of my research or the research done by members of my group, we work um, in the ranges, for example, of applied behavior, through to ecology and conservation, through to animal cognition. So in the applied animal behavior um, area, we basically talk about, or we've done work on um, New Zealand falcons, Cariaria, and whether or not they can um, give um, what we might call benefits to vineyards by um, attacking pest bird species. Uh, and so therefore provide um, economic yield to the vineyards. In fact, they do significantly. We also uh, work on the use of acoustics to try and detect um, unwanted pests such as bark beetles at borders or to try to disrupt their communication systems of um, unwanted pests on economically important crops. In the areas of ecology and conservation, once again, working with um, Kareareya, We've been looking at whether or not simultaneously the vineyards might be able to provide some benefits in terms of nesting success to the falcons um, through reduced predation. And so here the vineyard, you can see there's a lot less nest predation compared to um, their um, equivalent habitat in the hills that are not in vineyards. So there seems to be a win-win situation in that case. We also have found that, for example, Kia, which I'll be talking a little bit more about today, um, are um, really important alpine plant dispersers. In fact, they're the major alpine plant disperser, which um, has significant implications because, of course, Kia numbers are going down quite um, significantly due to predation um, by introduced predators, typically, lead poisoning and um, other, well, other anthropogenic effects, essentially. Most of my research, however, is actually on something I'm not going to be even touching on today, which is on um, jumping spiders and uh, cognition in jumping spiders. And these um, spiders behave kind of like miniature leopards. Uh, the only thing is that they're a lot easier to study. But the focus of today's talk is going to be on um, animal emotions, particularly discussing things like joy or positive affect, what we might call positive affect. So perhaps unsurprisingly, it was Charles Darwin 
who was the first to make clear the similarities between human and non-human animals in terms of emotions, which he exposed on at length, as was his wont, in a 399-page book called The Expression of the Emotions of Man and Animals. Um, and what, one thing I want to highlight with this slide is that this chapter, which is about expressions of emotion, facial expressions of emotions, most of these emotions, he does talk about expressions of joy and affection, but most of them are negative. They're about pain, anger, terror. Um, and that has been an, an overriding, um, I guess, way of thinking about non-human human potential emotions. We've been um, concentrating on the negative aspect of those emotions for, for good reason, perhaps, but we'll discuss more of that later. So this illustrates a relationship between um, short-term emotions. So emotions are short, they're brief, they're intense. They're often um, driven by a stimulus or event-driven. Um, they can um, often affect survival. Fear, for example, is often, uh, you know, it's an intense emotion and it will have a significant impact on whether or not you survive. Whereas if you combine lots of emotions, then you, you start getting into a longer, more, flight, more stable um, pattern, which we call a mood, right? So an emotion is very intense and brief. I would call joy, for example, um, an emotion or fear. Mood, you're in a good mood or you're in a bad mood. And affect combines moods and emotions. And we can actually discuss this in terms of valence. So we can say um, something has got positive affects, it's got a positive valence, or negative valence, or negative affects. So generally um, more, obviously, low versus high. So here what we can see is the much briefer emotion line, brief kind of spikes. Whereas the mood is, you know, more smoothed out. And then we can um, call the affective um, line, in this case the affective happiness line, is something that is in stable conditions quite long lasting, right? So it kind of takes into account all of that. So the question is, can we measure animal emotions, particularly positive animal emotions? So, um, one reason this is interesting is that we know from human studies that moods and emotions affect our decision making. They affect our judgments. Um, and the glass half full, glass half empty is a, a case in point. And we can actually use this same paradigm to um, measure whether or not animals might be feeling, for example, optimistic. You know, are you a glass half full type of Kia or are you a glass half empty type of Kia, right? And these are known as judgment bias or sometimes optimism bias tests. And ultimately, all it is is trying to test how an animal responds to an ambiguous stimulus. So for example, this, this has been done with a whole load of animals now. And to be fair, some more successful than others. But for example, you can train a dog to uh, a, a bowl with lots of really yummy kibbles in one location and an empty bowl in another spatial location. And so the question is, at the end of the day, if you put a bowl in the middle, then is the animal going to approach it really quickly as if it were a bowl half, a bowl full or a bowl empty, right? Is it going to take a long time to approach it because it's feeling negative or is it going to take a long time to approach, I mean, a, a short time to approach it because it's feeling optimistic. Glass half full, glass half empty. Now in the actual test, what you tend to do is it's not quite as simple as that. So you've got the animal, you've trained it for whatever it might be. Let's just go with the dog example. Uh, a spatial location for a good reward, a spatial location for a poor reward, but you normally give it actually multiple ambiguous stimuli. So you might give it one in the middle, but you might have a near positive and a near negative, for example. So these are various ways that we can start testing in the absence of language, which is, of course, very helpful when we study humans, but much more difficult when we're not studying humans. So can we ask a non-human animal how optimistic it might be feeling? So that's one way we can potentially measure animal emotions, particularly positivity or positive emotions. Another way we might be able to measure um, how an animal might be positively feeling 
is through play or through play vocalizations. Now, what I really want to highlight here is that play is um, pretty widespread phylogenetically, especially among mammals and particularly among primates. Half of that is primates. But really, with the exception of just a few animals up the top, all of these are mammals. Of course, those birds up at the, those animals at the top include the kia. And lots of these animals, but not all, seem to vocalize or seem to use some kind of noise, sound, sometimes sound that is above our range of hearing, uh, when they're actually playing. So potentially like human laughter. So maybe we can measure that and find out whether or not an animal is potentially feeling happy. Um, I'm going to be talking primarily about rats and kia today in the subsequent examples, kia because I work with them, and rats because by far the majority of work in this area has been done on rats. And rats produce ultrasonic calls, these purple ones here, and by that I mean they are above the range of human hearing, significantly above the range of human hearing. So they're at about 50 kilohertz, we, we hear to about 18 to 20 kilohertz. So we need specialized equipment to be able to record that because we obviously can't hear it. So again, potentially really useful kind of thing to know, but not something that's going to be practical in sort of everyday kind of terms. So I just want to give you an, an example of the variation that you find in play calls or in calls that are associated with play. So these are just a few of them. They're typically quite short bit like a human laugh, laugh, un unless we get the giggles, of course. Um, but you can see that they vary quite a lot. So here we've got the um, case of the laboratory rat that I was talking about, and we call those um, ultrasonic vocalizations, or USVs, because they're at about 50 kilohertz, which is, as I say, well, well above human hearing. Compare that with the macaque, which has, you know, most of its energy, as it's called, um, is about one kilohertz, which is a really deep rumble kind of sound. Uh, and then you've got things like the Kia, which uh, we found has got this particular call that we've called the warble call, which is associated with play, and as I'll show you later, seems to elicit play in others. So there's a lot of variation in terms of what these call structures look like. Okay, so our rats in a positive affective state, remember your affective happiness line, our rats in a positive affective state also more optimistic. That's ultimately the question that I want to be addressing in the next few slides. So what you can do, or what these authors did, Arugulada, is they trained rats on two sounds, which they could easily discriminate, as in here, the difference between them, one at uh, 2 kilohertz or 2,000 hertz, and one at 9 kilohertz. The one at 2 kilohertz was rewarded with a drop of sucrose solution, so food reward, positive. Uh, and the 9 kilohertz one, if they didn't, so they had to press a lever, by the way. And if they didn't press the lever for the negative one, they got a little electric shock, right, on the foot. So they very rapidly learned to discriminate between the I get a food reward and I don't get a, an electric shock uh, with a negative one. And then they tested them um, with two groups. They basically um, had uh, one group of rats that was um, belly tickled, which apparently is something that rats really like. Um, so they get on their backs and you tickle their bellies and they produce a lot of these ultrasonic vocalizations. Um, which they call laughter in this one. And um, one group was, was not um, tickled, it was just handled. So the question is, if you give them an ambiguous cue, so a five kilohertz sound, are they gonna press the positive lever or are they gonna press the negative lever? Of course, this is a judgment bias test, but you're manipulating the potential mood of the animal before going in, right? And so they um, did an optimism in index, which you don't really have to worry about. And essentially what they found is that overall, the overall results were that actually it didn't make any difference in terms of their positivity or their optimism, whether or not they were handled or tickled. And so they were a bit surprised by that because they obviously expected the tickled rats to be more optimistic. And um, 
So then they started looking at their data a little bit more clearly, and they found that, in fact, some of the rats that were in the tickling group just weren't laughers. They were just, I don't know, call them grumpy rats. <laughs> and, and so they just, didn't, they, they just didn't laugh. They didn't produce these um, ultrasonic vocalizations. And so then they reanalyzed the data, splitting those, and they found that, sure enough, when you only considered the rats that actually did produce these vocalizations, they were significantly more optimistic or more willing to press the, um, you know, the positive lever than the um, rest of the rats. So it does suggest that potentially these rats were, the, the positive rats were actually feeling more glass half full about life, right? Which is kind of an interesting way to try and approach uh, how this could affect the judgments of other animals, not just humans. But we can't expect, in practical terms, we can't expect people to be running judgment biases or have ultrasonic microphones and things like that. So we really want to try and get at some kind of measure that um, is of practical use. Uh, in terms of how we can measure valence or the positivity or the negativity of the animal in question. And so people are really now trying to focus on whether or not you can um, determine facial expressions of an animal, whether or not, for example, I mean, a smile in humans is a little bit ambiguous because a smile can be very um, positive, but sometimes it can be a bit of a grimace. Sometimes it can be a sort of a socially awkward smile. So these things can be quite subtle. Um, but if we can work out those subtleties, then potentially we have a more practical way of approaching these things. So in this case, what they did is they did the old belly tickle on the rats as a positive um, group. And the negative group uh, was put in a novel environment, an empty room with white noise or static, which would be pretty unpleasant for anybody, and rats don't like it either. And sure enough, the tickled rat produced uh, quite a lot of, of ultrasonic vocalizations. And the non-tickled, white noise, empty room, all alone rats, unsurprisingly, did not. But one thing that they did notice, they measured very carefully, but with machine learning, these sorts of things can be done relatively easily once you can train the computer. Um, so what they did is they, obviously, they had more of these um, ultrasonic vocalizations, but they also had redder ears, so there was more blood flow to the ears, and the ears were um, flatter compared to the, um, the bad treatment rats. So in other words, potentially we might be starting to get some facial indicators that might suggest that an animal is feeling relatively happy compared to relatively unhappy. And they've been doing this with lots of animals. It's not just rats. There are horses and all sorts of things. But we're still not there yet. I do want to get to make, make the point clear that we're not there yet. But there are some good indications that at least with some animals, some of them being domestic animals, which is going to be particularly useful for things like animal welfare, um, there might be um, some facial expressions that can uh, reliably be used. So, um, so this is a study that uh, looked at, I don't know, about 100 species of Australian uh, native birds. And basically what, what she did was um, she looked at birds that um, play and birds that tool use. Often it's the same species, both tool use and play. And she um, looked at the relationship between tool use and play and longevity, how long an animal lives, and also relative brain mass. Now, tool use, particularly, more so than play, has been studied extensively in birds. And it's almost always assumed that it's related to, um, to the cognitive ability of the animal. So we've got our Kia, are actually one of them, but they don't use tools in nature anyway. Um, but New Caledonian crows, you might have heard of New Caledonian crows, famous tool users, uh, considered to be the smartest of all birds. I'd argue for the Kia. Um, but, but, um, but it's possibly a bit of an anthropocentric thing to assume that because they use tools, it's related to um, cognition rather than anything else. 
So here this was kind of a novel way of approaching it because she was just looking at, at this is correlational, but nevertheless she was looking at this from more than just that anthropocentric point of view. And what she found is that when she just looked at the species, this is multiple species um, that played versus uh, species that did not play, um, the species that played lived significantly longer than the non-playing species, but there was absolutely no relationship between how long an animal lived and whether or not it uses tools. She then looked at the same thing, but looked at relative brain size, and by relative brain size, I mean she's accounting for the body size of the animal because you can't compare a human to a blue whale. Um, and so um, what she found is that birds that use tools actually don't have brains that are any larger than non-tool using birds. However, there was a big difference between the birds that play and the birds that don't play in terms of um, having relatively larger brains. So potentially, we have been considering this slightly the wrong way around. Okay, so playful teasing. This is something that Toddlers know a lot about, um, as do adults. And it's uh, found, well, so far it's only been described in, in primates, including in this orangutan. And basically here, the teaser is performing some, some unexpected act. And it seems to be a deliberate, um, you know, it's kind of deliberately violating the expectations of the receiver of that act or of the prearranged conditions, if you like, um, of the understanding of the receiver. So it might suggest some kind of, suggesting some sort of theory of mind that you're kind of attributing the, the state of mind of the receiver of your action. So here the um, orangutan <coughs> is behind the mesh and the female is there. It's quite a dark screen, I'm sorry. Um, and the female's there and the male just pokes um, a stick out waggles it in front of her, and of course then, you know, having had her interest peaked, she tries to grab it and he pulls it away. We've all done that sort of thing quite often. Um, and so then, not very long afterwards, he does the same thing, and then he starts really wiggling the stick in front of her face, and so she tries to bite the stick and he retracts it. So a classic case of playful teasing, and he's violating the expectations, if you like, as she's expecting to grab that stick, but he's pulling it back. Um, so it does suggest that maybe this, possibly, um, this primate is attributing some sort of state of mind to the female, the male, attributing what he thinks the female should respond like. So attributing kind of a, getting the female to, to create a false belief, essentially. Now, that, that might be far out there, um, but these theory of, of mind questions are interesting ones and I think important ones to consider. Whether or not we can necessarily study them, I think we probably can. We might not yet have you know, got the, the right tools to do it, but you know, 20 years ago we wouldn't have even think, thought about um, looking at tool use in birds, and now it's part of the course. So um, I think we can, we can move on, but of course, when we're talking about teasing, we couldn't really go further without discussing the clown of the mountains, the kia. Now kia are taonga. Uh, during the 1879 um, Smith Nairn Royal Commission of Inquiry uh, into Naitahu land claims, the Naitahu Kaumata uh, recorded that in Makarore, the Makarore region of Wanaka, or near Wanaka, uh, kia were, were actually gathered as kai, uh, among other things, or lots of things. And so that provides historical evidence, actually, of the close connection between Māori and kia. And of course, in the South Island, anybody associated with the mountains or near mountains would be familiar with kia. Uh, but I do want to point out that although we tend to think of kia as an alpine, alpine parrot, parrot, that is not technically true. They are a, essentially a forest parrot that spends quite a lot of time in the alpine zone. Problem is, you never see them in the forest because they're really, really cryptic. And so you wouldn't know that they're there. But Kia are famous for a number of things, including, of course, being quite playful. This is um, a photo that I was very tempted to show at, 
at a talk I was giving where I knew the VC was going to be there, but then I decided not to. <laughs> um, anyway, so people tend to think of this, of course, you know, destruction when they think of Kia. But of course, they do much more than this. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been to ski fields and the car parks and they grab stones and they run over to the end, edge of the car park, which of course is a cliff, and they toss the stone, look down, go back to the next stone. And they can spend a long time doing that, right? So lots of popular pastimes that they do, and not all of them involve the destruction of tents and various things like that. So they have lots of different types of play. They play on the ground, like the stone tossing that I was talking about. They have aerial play, so they'll actually you know, roll around in the air. They'll catch thermal, um, thermal drafts. Uh, they will dive down and then roll. Uh, it's pretty amazing to watch. So this is some aerial play. Again, very dark, but there's a Kia there, and there's one beginning a dive there. They play by themselves. They have solitary play. They play in groups. They have social play. They play with objects. Uh, so in other words, they have every type of play that is described in all animals. But one thing that is unusual about Kia play is that in most animals that play, it's typically the juveniles, the young animals that play. Sometimes the adults play with their young, but typically, with humans being quite a notable exception, it's the young that play and only during that juvenile phase. That is not the case for Kia. Kia play as juveniles and as adults. Um, and they'll play with anything and anyone. So, oh, God, this is so dark. Anyway, that's us. And we were going to be running some tests on Kia up in Aoraki. This is in near Red Tarns. And, uh, well, the Kia are, of course, following us because they know we've got things that they can throw off the cliffs. Um, and so the experiments didn't go at all well because we spent the entire time running up and down the cliffs going to get the stuff. Um, but that's, that's the nature of working with Kia in the field. And I can't even see the Kia in that photo in this. I think it's in there. But anyway, that's, that's doing a dive. So lots of aerial play as well, which people don't tend to realize. Of course, they also have things like rough and tumble play, uh, where they will, I mean, this could just be like a, an avian dog. Um, and they will kick each other. And they'll take turns. One of them will roll on its back, and the other one will jump on the belly. and. Um, and, and, and then they'll take turns, swap over. So it's, it's classic play behavior as in this tit for tat. Has anybody seen that? Yeah, OK. It's pretty cool, because that, that has rules of engagement, right? You can't violate that, because if not, everything goes pear-shaped. You know, when toddlers violate that, there are screams and tears, right? So, so there are all sorts of expectations about and rules of engagement in terms of how to play. And it's suggested that maybe this is the, the, that kind of tit for tat, learning to, to concord and actually behave according to those rules of engagement might be the beginnings of morality. Um, so now I'm going to play you a three minute clip, which is uh, really quite cool on Kia. And I wish I could take credit for it. <laughs> I'm sure many of you saw the stolen GoPro footage last year um, in uh, Fjordland somewhere where they just left a GoPro on, on the hut veranda and the Kia took it off for a little wander. Um, so it's not all bad doing field work. You get some pretty spectacular views when you're not collecting the stuff that the Kia has stolen. Um, but most of our field work is in the Alpine regions and that's mainly because it has been too hard for us to study Kia in the forest literally because we can't find them. It's, it's just really tough to spot them. So one of the things that we've been looking at, of course, is Kia vocalizations. And because I can, I will play you some vocalizations that Kia do, because most people tend to associate Kia with just the one call. Um, so the chatter call is this one. <coughs> Familiar? <coughs> That's the screech. This is the mew. <coughs> then there's the screech trill, which combines screech and trill. Now this is the trill. Now you're going to have to listen carefully for the whistle. It's very silent. And then finally there's that call that I told you we called the warble call, which is the one that's associated with play, which is this one. <laughs> so um, 
people call this the Kia laughter call. There's huge variation, of course, um, based on sex, based on the individual, and based on the age in terms of how frequently they use these calls and various other parameters of it. But the key thing to remember is a warble call is the play call. So emotional contagions are uh, basically when there's emotional state matching with, from one individual to another. And it's considered a basic form of empathy. So humans, for example, um, might experience an emotional contagion if somebody, if you're interacting with somebody who's having um, like a really negative emotional experience or in a panic, you might also develop a bit of a panicky kind of negative emotional experience. So you might also start feeling down. That would be an emotional contagion. Um, and similarly, smiling is contagious. So I'll pass it on. So we wondered whether or not the Kia Warble call was in fact um, a play call and whether or not it was an emotional contagion in that it elicited play. So what we did is we um, put a Kia proof speaker, easier said than done, um, in, in an area and we would play them um, any number of different, well, five different um, sounds, one of which was a South Island Robin, which would be found in their areas. The screech call, which I just played you, that Kia call, a pure tone, um, you know, just like a white noise. Uh, the warble call, which we've been talking about, and another Kia call, the whistle. And then we just measured, in this case, uh, the number of times that they played um, per minute or whatever it was in a period of time just before the, um, we played the sound, during the sound, and after the sound. And what you can see is that there's no change in terms of their play with any of these except with the warble. Uh, and so the warble, they immediately start playing um, a lot more. And I want to just highlight how new this, um, this area of particularly positive emotions in animals is in terms of research. This was, we published this five years ago. It was the first, and still is actually, um, first example of um, experimentally induced behavior, um, play behavior in any wild animal and the first evidence of a positive emotional contagion in a bird. And the only other one was the rat, the lab rat. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done in this area because I'm sure the Kia are not unique. Uh, you might hear my student giggling. Um, this is an example of the experiment. Many of you will recognize where this is. So, immediate response to the call. Now, of course, we know that human moods, at least, are affected by the weather. And, you know, and, uh, for me, it's terrible. Like, too many days without sun, and I'm just totally depressed. And so we're actually starting to explore the case with Kia, whether or not this affects um, their behavior. I certainly have a view that when it's bright sunlight and it's just snowed, they're really, really playful. And certainly when it's raining, they just go misery guts with their feathers fluff, fluffed up into the trees and just look really morose. But maybe I'm just being a little bit anthropocentric there. Um, we have found that um, the warble call does seem to be um, called more often during sun than during cloudy or overcast or rainy days. But um, as I say, we're still, we're still working on this. It takes a long time to collect data from the field. But they also call more generally. I mean, just in general, call more. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stick my neck out with that one just yet. So I want to go back to the rats. Um, there are lots of hypotheses regarding the function of play, and I'm not going to go into all of them because that's a lecture in and of itself. But one of them might be simply that it's fun. No other reason than it's fun. And in this um, recent study, the um, authors basically showed that. Rats uh, could play hide and seek with humans. And they trained five male rats to, um, to literally play with the humans and be either hider or seeker. And that's, that's key because it's two different roles, right? Um, so in the seek condition, the rats obviously had to learn to look for the humans that were hidden. And they had to keep seeking until they found these humans. When they found the humans, they were rewarded with a little bit of a cuddle, but they were not given food. In the hide condition, they had to obviously hide, uh, and they were given a few like decoys, like transparent boxes, 
which is obviously a really bad place to hide, but on the other hand, it does have cover. Um, then they were given opaque boxes and cardboard covers, right? Um, so let's have a look at what they did. So um, a few more movies here. This one's going to be about a minute. So here what they did is they placed the rat in a closed box. They open it with a remote control. So there's the rat being placed in the box. And then that'll be opened, and the rat will begin to look for the experimenter. And once the target is found, then we'll be rewarded with a cuddle. So, um, quite a lot of cuddles. <laughs> so in the random seek, the experimenter randomly picked different um, hiding places. So it wouldn't necessarily always hide in the same place. Um, in, in other ones, they hid in the same place. So here, obviously, the experimenter is hiding in a different place, and the rat's looking everywhere. But one of the things that they found interesting was that the rats tended to search systematically. So if the experimenter had been hiding in a certain location the trial before, they typically went to look in that location first. So it seemed like they were being quite systematic about it. So in um, the block seek trials, uh, the person is hiding in the same place multiple times. Am I playing the same movie that I played last time? I've lost track now. It's not even playing, is it? <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> So they can clearly learn when, when they um, are in the same hiding location. <laughs> Predictable. <laughs> yeah. Now they're just being mean. I did that to my father when I was five, and I got, where is Jimena? <laughs> um, okay, so in other more complex um, cases, the role was reversed, so the rat was placed in the box, and it was um, trained that if the experimenter squatted behind the, beside the box um, and the lid was left open, that it was the rat's time to be the hider rather than the seeker, right? So that was the way the rat was trained. OK, it's your turn to hide now. Um, and once again, if the person um, found the animal, it was rewarded. So there was a reward in terms of cuddles for it to learn to, to be the hider. So let's see what happens.
we've all done that too. So the next video is basically a few more examples of that, but I think I'll um, give that a miss. I want to point out that the rats were quite strategic about this. So when they um, were uh, seeking, they would emit vocalizations of various different types, but when they were hiding, they were silent, quiet as a rat. Um, and they obviously chose, as you could see from those videos, they chose the opaque boxes, not the transparent boxes. And when they were um, found, or when they found the human, they did produce these um, ultrasonic vocalizations. So maybe they were actually doing it um, just for the fun of it. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to play that one. I'm going to run out of time. So this was in The Guardian less than two weeks ago. Um, and here the argument actually is that we can't tell. Uh, but at least it's being discussed, and I think that's really important that we actually start discussing these questions. Um, so that the rats potentially might have found the um, hide-and-seek kind of game intrinsically rewarding, which the authors seem to think was the case, um, provides quite a good segue into discussing the ethical implications of our treatment of animals, particularly, for example, in animal welfare, including in research. And now that we're starting to get a firm idea and a good understanding of how to measure emotions, particularly the more tricky, difficult emotion, I mean, positive emotions, which are harder to measure than the negative ones, um, this is a time to be starting to really rethink how we um, consider our animal welfare issues. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, most of the research, including since Darwin first conceived of it, has been really bias toward negative affect, towards fear um, and pain and things like this. And of course, there's good reason for that, right? Because those typically are going to be associated with a very bad outcome, potentially, you know, the animal dying. And so there are some very obvious, direct, and immediate consequences of not attending to, um, to negative affect. But now that we might, and, and often they are, you know, accompanied with, with quite obvious uh, vocalizations, sounds, for example, of pain, um, things like this that are rel relatively easily identifiable. Positive emotions, much more difficult to identify those emotions, which is why any kind of vocalization or any kind of um, feature in the body posture or in the face of the animal that could potentially indicate that an animal is feeling positive rather than negative would be useful. We can't expect, for example, farmers to run judgment bias tests. That's just not really very practical. So if we can find reliable and easily measurable indicators of positive affect, that would be um, a good thing. And vocalizations, body postures seem to be the best way to go for, um, for the moment. So we can really think of welfare really as, you know, we've got our, our intense emotions that are going to lead to the broader affective state. And it could be positive or negative, of course. And if we think of it in terms of it being on a seesaw, of course, where it tilts will provide an indication of the welfare of the animal, whether or not the welfare, animal welfare is fairly good or less than so, not so, you know, not so good. So the New Zealand Welfare um, Act um, from 1999 defines physical health and behavioral needs of an animal as proper and sufficient food and water, adequate shelter, the opportunity to display normal patterns of behavior, appropriate physical handling, and protection from, from and rapid diagnosis of injury and disease. So in other words, they must alleviate pain and distress, negative side of things. Which again, as I say, makes total sense. But if we can start now looking into and understanding positive affect, wouldn't it be nice to be able to, rather than let's just measure how terrible things are, measure how good things are, might that not be an improvement? Now, the Welfare Act was amended in 2015 uh, with the committee acknowledging the and making explicit recognition of animal sentience. Um, so that would be really good. The trouble is that um, they provide you know, a definition of animal sentience, but they did not change any of the bullet points of the Animal Welfare Act that I gave you two slides ago. So they don't um, provide any indication of how we might go about 
making things tilt to the positive side of that seesaw, right? So for example, instead of um, providing the opportunity to display normal patterns of behavior, perhaps an argument should be made that they should be able to, on balance, display behavior that is tilted towards positive affect, right? So there's, there's a lot of room for improvement and your interest and your involvement as members of the public, we are a democratic country, as members of the public, it's um, your decisions and your action that will affect the decisions of the future and the um, amendments of the future in the act. So it's, it's up to us to try and, and maybe make some changes there. And with that, I would like to thank you once again for all coming and open the room up for questions. And um, we've got a couple of microphones that will be passed around. Uh, please just keep the question sort of a simple, simple one question or one sentence question. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, a question about the bird building the nest. The, the nest. Um, bird building the nest. Yeah, or, or the beaver building the dam to oh, right, yeah. block the river. Uh, do you think these two behavior, uh, uh, um, the the skill is genetically learned or no? It's genetic or nurture learned after birth or according to Daniel Dennett, he wrote a book up about called. Uh, from bacteria to back and back, uh, talk about the evolution of mind. He seems to give the word called, uh, it's a German word called Amwelt, W-U-M-W-E-L-T. Yeah. -E he translated into like a affordance. But uh, if, if he's, a, she, she, he denies it's from genetic, nor from nurture. So if, we, if you exclude genetic and nurture both, so what other means could you, could you pass between generations? What was the last part of the question, sorry? So how could these skills pass from gen uh, between generations, neither from genetic nor from nurture afterwards? So the, the question, as I understand it, is things like a beaver building a dam or a bird building a nest. Is that nature or nurture? And if it's neither, which um, Dan Dennett might have suggested, which I probably don't think that he suggested exactly that way, um, how could that be passed on? The, the answer is, um, um, it can't be if it's neither, <laughs> but, but there is no neither. In fact, everything is going to have a combination of both some, um, some I mean, not necessarily everything is going to have an, a learned component, but anything that is what we might say genetic or innate, which basically just means that the first time the animal performs it, it does a reasonably good job of it, right? Um, so you might, those, those types of behaviors, which does include um, nest building behavior, uh, might be, first of all, yes, there's going to be a genetic template for that, so that's going to get passed on. However, all of those behaviors will improve with experience. No matter how innate a behavior, it will improve with experience. Um, the other thing that I would say is that when, when considering those sorts of questions about nature versus nurture, I mean, the first thing is that the animal's got to have, even if it was all nurture, like all experience, the animal's actually got to survive long enough for that to actually to, to learn. So there's all sorts of, I mean, the, the dichotomy doesn't really exist. Um, so I suspect, I mean, I, I, I don't think Dan Dennett probably said necessarily, well, not what anything that I've read of Dan Dennett would have suggested that, um, that there would be a, 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 a behavior that, that doesn't have, that can be passed on, that doesn't have a genetic and or um, you know, experience part of it. I hope that answers the question. How, how about a, oh. a, a baby cat? I'll just we maybe come back later, and we'll because I just want to pass it on. Yep. Um, I'm interested uh, that uh, this is developing quickly, and uh, appreciate that machine learning probably helps a lot. Mm -hmm. But have you um, found out whether other animals? Um, can recognize um, the happiness or emotions in um, uh, animals uh, better than us. For example, other birds respond to 
Kia's happiness or dogs recognize um, emotion uh, in, in other animals? Um, anecdotally, um, once again, turning to the negative one, I mean, you can see, if, if you see cows being taken towards a slaughter area, you'd know immediately that there's a negative emotional contagion going on there. They can immediately pick up that the cows in front are terrified. Um, so yes, absolutely. But, you know, anecdotally, nobody, as far as I know, nobody's ever actually looked at that very interesting question of whether or not animals of the same species are more tuned, which you'd expect them to be. Um, to, to, you know, the, the, the mood, let's say, of the other members of the group. Oh, different species. Um, in some species where they're, uh, very quickly, and then we're going to pass on, but uh, in, some, in some groups where the animals often interact, different species interact, because they're multi-species um, you know, groups or that have common interactions, they certainly are tuned to the vocalizations. They know each other's vocalizations. They know, for example, that's an alarm call or whatever it might be. So again, nobody's looked at it specifically in terms of emotions, but yeah, I would, I would hazard a yes to that. Uh, are you studying uh, over here? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> are you studying any other animals than uh, kias and uh, rats in animal behaviour? Or is it just those specific groups currently? So the question is whether or not I study any other animals than kia and rats. Um, I actually only work on kia in, in, in terms of this. The so rat studies were not mine. Um, I work on all sorts of different animals, but primarily kia and jumping spiders, actually. Hi there. Um, I wanted to ask, what, what are you going to be studying next, and is there anything in the future with pharmacology and chemistry in the brain and that side of things, rather than just behavioural, yeah. if you're studying cognition and things like that? The question is whether or not there are pharmacological, uh, brain imaging, et cetera, kind of studies um, in, in this area. Uh, I wouldn't be doing that. That's not my expertise necessarily. Um, but yes, a lot of work. I didn't want to go down that route because I knew I wasn't going to have time. A lot of work has been done, not surprisingly, most of it on rats. But both pharmacological and neuroimaging studies have been done, and we know the pathways for those, S those ultrasonic vocalizations follow the, the um, dopamine, serotonin pathways that, that humans would have. So we know that the, the neuroanatomy, the wiring of the mammalian kind of ones is the same. Seems like the neuroanatomy of the avian brain is following uh, homologous, you know, the areas that, that light up, let's say, in neuroimaging studies, um, follow the homologous pattern that you'd expect from human and other mammal studies. Yeah. Hi. Um. Uh, so, have cares been observed to display grieving behaviours? Do cares form attachments? Um, you, you mean like elephants, or...? Perhaps not in the same way as elephants, but just uh, behaviours which could be grieving behaviours? Uh, so the question is, have Kia been um, shown to have grieving behaviours? Nobody's um, investigated grieving behaviour. They certainly form attachments. I mean, they're fairly monogamous. So they would certainly form an attachment to their partner over multiple years. Um, they do this, they're, they're what we might call fish and fusion groups. So during some times of the year when the younger and the fledglings are around, they'll come together in, in groups of teenage bands. Um, and typically an adult, often a male, will supervise, will kind of do look after the crèche of unruly Kia young. Um, and, and they're pretty stable, those, for some months of the year, and then they all disperse and do their own thing. So um, they certainly form some form of attachments. Grieving behavior has never been looked at. I think there was a question up, up there. Hi, awesome lecture, thank you. Um, quick question, mentioned it right at the start was lead poisoning was a problem, and I just wondered where the lead was coming from. Uh, so lead poisoning is a problem for care mortality. It's, pro yeah, it's probably number two 
Um, the lead is coming primarily from two sources, from old huts. So Doc is making a concerted effort to try and change all the lead flashings and lead nails and things on the huts. But, you know, there are thousands of huts up in the mountains. And then, of course, there's, you know, old things on farms. Um, but lead shot is another one. The actual source of what is causing most of the lead poisoning hasn't been done yet. It's probably a combination of both. Hello. Um, I just wondered, you, you said about playing white noise to the rats, and I just wondered, like with plant studies they do, playing music, have they tried playing different musics to see if they do better or do worse? If, say, for example, they hate Barry Man Manilow or whatever. Uh, so have, have different music. Uh, does music change optimism? Um, Actually, that's an experiment I'm hoping to run on Kia. <laughs> um, I can't think of the top of my head, but I do have a snagging sensation that it might have been done with dogs and that music did affect. But you can't put it, it's not like a human, a human, oh, that's a bouncy, you know, optimistic beat. It's not necessarily the way you might predict, but it, I think from memory there has been a study on dogs and there was a difference in, in um, the behavior of the dogs depending on the type of music. Thank you. Um, I'm just thinking about the tool use and the um, the, the purpose behind play. So the purpose behind tools and what you may interpret that to be, but then d do you have a feeling on what, what the purpose behind play is and why that's responding so strongly to the stimuli that you're giving it? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so what's the purpose um, behind play? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to phrase that primarily in terms of Kia. So there are lots of... Um, as I said, lots of different hypotheses behind why play might have evolved. As I've mentioned, it's particularly common in mammals. Um, it's particularly common in mammals that have got extended juvenile periods um, that might take a long time to learn their skills. It's also particularly common among, among carnivorous or omnivorous animals, so animals that might have to learn to hunt. So one of the primary uh, hypotheses behind play is that it's actually a way of gaining some form of motor um, hand pull, you know, eye pull, eye claw, eye, whatever it might be, you know, coordination, some motor coordination and hunting skills. So think about your cat playing with, or your kitten playing with the, the yarn. It's essentially, you know, pouncing on prey. And so um, the thought is that it's actually just to develop those skills. And that's probably quite likely to be the case in many um, mammals, particularly those which require quite a long time to learn how to hunt. Um, that's not the case really with Kia, although Kia do have to learn to forage for food in actually quite complex ways, but none that have got anything to do with their types of play behavior. Uh, with Kia, it's a bit of a conundrum. My completely personal feeling is that Kia didn't evolve with predators. The harsh eagle, Kia would have been a peanut to it. It wouldn't have bothered. Um, so. The, the, that's the only predator I can really think of. So I suspect that Kia really didn't have the selective pressure that most animals would have in terms of having to you know, be quite risk averse and be wary of predators. I think that Kia had a bit of time on their hands and they do have an extended lifespan and they do have quite an extended juvenile span and they had plenty to eat. And I actually literally, in the case of Kia, I don't think this is normally the case with play, but in the case of Kia, I think they just do it for the fun of it. There's a question up there. They certainly do, that's, that's interesting. You've seen them actually hunt cut out here? Wow, that's... I'm suggesting it's just like cats in that respect, that they, the, the, play, the, the play that we've been, you know, that you're suggesting is just play behaviour. I'm suggesting that's actually the, the same purpose as the purpose of cats. Wow. You know, like a cat's not going to kill its siblings, uh, but it'll do the same thing and kill a rat. And, and as I've said, the, the care certainly predates uh, more parrots. 
see that? Cool. Right. That's fascinating. So um, that's just group hunting. I've never, I mean, here definitely I have to, you know, do some pretty interesting foraging stuff and I have to learn lots of stuff, but that's really interesting that you've seen group hunting. Um, No, no, you wouldn't be happy. Yeah. Oh, well, that's interesting, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, that's, that's interesting. Thank you for pointing that out. That's, uh, maybe there is some learning of skills involved. Oh, yes, we are out of time. So thank you very much, and um, all the best. Thank you.